them entail? Could this really work? How would they square with our aspirations for such a system? How would they actually square with the goal of having a healthier country? I think today's discussion is going to explore these questions. We are really delighted to welcome a panel of distinguished thinkers representing many sides of the single-payer debate, and I am very much looking forward to learning from this conversation. Before we begin, I want to thank everybody who makes this happen, all the members of our community, particularly Meredith Brown, who heads the team behind this. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn the stage over to our moderator, our friend Jonathan Woodson, director of the Boston University Institute for Health System Innovation and Policy, and a faculty member in our school. He will lead the day and introduce the speakers. Professor Woodson. Well, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, uh, we want you to uh, uh, engage the, the panel, and I think you're going to have uh, an interesting time because we really do have a distinguished panel here today. So thank you, uh, Dean Galea, and welcome to all of you to this Health Policy Forum on the single-payer health care uh, aspirations and realities. This forum comes as a follow-up to the session we held in the spring uh, called Medicare for All. Is it feasible? And during that uh, session, we had a lively conversation, but also received some criticism, uh, some constructive criticism, regarding landing too conservatively on uh, what uh, the analysis uh, brought forth. So uh, we look forward to this discussion and have expanded, uh, again, our panel uh, with a lot of distinguished individuals. Uh, as we took that criticism, uh, uh, you know, very seriously, um, as Dean Galera said, we decided to look at the perspectives uh, of healthcare reform from a single-payer system. Uh, we look forward to uh, all of the panelists' insights, and uh, we'll ask them to outline their positions on the issue, highlighting the important considerations, whether they be economic, political, social, or moral that they feel are most relevant uh, to uh, moving toward a single-payer system. Following the panelists' presentation, there will be more free-flowing discussion, an opportunity for each of you as the audience uh, to be engaged uh, with the panel. I request, uh, A, that you silence uh, all of your cell phones, uh, and that when you ask questions, uh, be please, uh, 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 please be as succinct as possible to give as many of you an opportunity to ask questions and the panelists to give uh, their answers. So let's begin today. Uh, <clears throat> we have, as I mentioned, uh, very distinguished members of the panel. First is Dr. Claudia Fagan, who is Chief Medical Officer for the Cook County Health and Hospital System, and John H. Uh, Stroger, Junior Hospital of Cook County. Uh, she's National Coordinator for Physicians for a National Health Program and President of the Chicago-based Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. Dr. Fagan has appeared on national television and radio, testified before Congress on a wide range of health care issues. Uh, following Dr. Uh, Fagan will be uh, Dr. Steffi Wol Wolhandler, the Distinguished Professor at the City University of New York Hunter College a primary care uh, doctor in the South Bronx and lecturer in medicine at Harvard Medical School, where she was formerly a professor of medicine. She is a, a former Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow and worked for Senator Paul Wellstone and then Congressman Bernie Sanders, so we look forward to her remarks. Uh, she has published more than 150 journal articles and is a leading advocate on, uh, of nonprofit national health insurance. She was, in fact, uh, a co-founder of Physicians for National Health Program and has written on medical bankruptcy, among many other topics, uh, but that particular topic was co-authored by Elizabeth Warren. We also have Mr. Robert Moffitt, who is a senior fellow in domestic policy studies at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Mr. Moffitt has had a long time uh, specialized interest in health care and entitlement programs, especially Medicare. He brings to the reform effort uh, his government experience as a senior official of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Personnel and Management uh, during the Reagan administration. So thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Marion uh, C. Bombaug is a gynecologist at the Community Health Center of Cape Cod and past president of the Massachusetts Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Dr. Bombarg is a member of the Massachusetts delegation of the American Medical Association and was executive medical director of the Population Health and Medical Director for Quality and Patient uh, Safety at Reliant Medical Group and was associate medical director for quality for the Stewart Healthcare System uh, Network. In addition to her clinical work and activities, she is uh, 
uh, activity in organized medicine, Dr. Bombaug has also served on the board of uh, uh, Celti Care Health. Dr. Jody Leo is a policy researcher at RAND Corporation. Her research primarily focuses on issues related to healthcare financing and payment. Dr. Leo uh, has uh, experience uh, using simulation models uh, for um, an analysis for effects on, of health healthcare policy changes on health insurance coverage, uh, household and government spending, and provider revenues. Her work has involved assessing healthcare reform proposals, alternative payment models, and policy options for single payer uh, healthcare. So, thank you for, for being here. Uh, and last but not least is Ms. Liz Hamill, who's Vice President and Director of Public Op Opinion and Survey Research at Kaiser Family Foundation, where she directs polling work, including the monthly health tracking poll and ongoing survey partnerships with news media organizations such as the Washington Post. Los Angeles Times and CNN. Her public opinion research experience uh, spans a wide range of health-related uh, topics, in, including health uh, people, uh, including people's experiences in healthcare systems, uh, views uh, of the ACA, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance uh, attitudes, and experiences related to prescription drugs and the role of healthcare in elections. So we really look forward to your, your comments. She's an active member of the American uh, Association for Public Opinion Research uh, in its specific chapter and has served on the Executive Council uh, for both organizations. So as you can see, we have an outstanding panel here uh, who is going to inform um, and actually uh, engage us, uh, and we look forward to their remarks. So Dr. Fagan, uh, thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you. All right, always. Uh, um, so um, I just, I, you know, one of the privileges of um, working at Cook County is uh, the ability of physicians to be able to take care of patients without worrying about their ability to pay um, and just to take care of the patient. So I just came off of the ward service, where as an attending physician I supervise uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, on uh, Monday, October 7th, uh, my first day on service, we admitted a 36-year-old man who um, had been at a, another hospital where he was admitted uh, with obstructive cyst symptoms and found to have uh, colon cancer. Uh, stage four, um, they did the uh, removal of a sigmoid mass, and they also uh, did the biopsy of a liver mass to make the diagnosis of uh, metastasis. And you'll see, this is his, this is, so he was discharged from the hospital, um, and I'll show that it said that um, in the chart, uh, let's see if we can find, however, patient does not have insurance. And so his follow-up plan was that he would follow up at Cook County, because um, not having insurance would delay his care. Um, so I have to say that, you know, they did, as I said, they did the surgery, they removed the mass, um, they did the biopsy, um, so they did the appropriate thing. They even put in a port for his chemotherapy. Um, and then they gave him his records and said, uh, now go to county because uh, um, we, don't <laughs> we, don't, we can't do anything else for you. Um, and I, I bring this up because people think that we're past that point, that we don't continue to uh, dump patients, that we don't uh, continue to turn people away based on their ability to pay. And uh, this young man um, has been just handed the most horrific uh, diagnosis he could receive and uh, was told that he would have to find a, a new doctor. We were happy to uh, take care of him, but it, uh, it's a lot to unpack in a, a, a short period of time. So I would say to you that um, every country in the world has uh, had to wrestle with this issue. Um, and it is a challenge for us all. But uh, they all seem to find some way, uh, some way to address this issue. And you know, as countries are, are like people, they have different personalities and different approaches. Um, and I would say that there's some common financial models. There's the National Health Service, we think of like uh, UK, uh, New Zealand, where, uh, and Italy, where they have socialized mo money, they have uh, socialized medicine, they have public funding and uh, public delivery. 
Um, there is the uh, National Health Service. We could think about Spain or Ireland, uh, Canada or Australia, um, where you have public funding and, and private delivery. Um, then you have the uh, Bismarck model or the all payer. I would, uh, people say this is the closest thing to us, named after Otto Bismarck, who um, they have uh, mixed funding with uh, private delivery. Um, it's very regulated um, that uh, the individual plans are not allowed to compete against each other on the basis of cost. Um, and there's uh, expectation in terms of delivery and people compete on, on services. Um, and so a lot of folks say this would be the easiest transition for the United States, that we could be more regulated. Um, I will tell you that in Germany where they have these sickness funds, when they have, um, as I said, they do not compete on the basis of cost. Um, and, but when they have, um, there's an expectation um, that if you have one group that has adverse selection and is losing money, and you have another group that um, is doing better because maybe they have good selection, that the, they would be expected to assist or bail out the group that's not doing so well. And I think what uh, my problem with that in the American model is I just don't see Cigna writing that check to Aetna. Um, but then there's the, um, the U U.S. plan where we have mixed funding and mixed delivery. And um, I would say to you that while every other country has figured out some way in which to do this, they most figure, mostly figure out a way in which they can cover almost everyone. And one of the challenges we have is that we still leave at least 15% of our population that's uncovered. And I would say to you that um, we don't even talk about the number of people that we have left uh, underinsured. And that is something that cannot be underestimated. We deal with it uh, on a daily basis at county. We have people who have deductibles of uh, $3,500 or 5000 and who can't afford to access the care that they need. So um, when I look at health care delivery in the United States, I say that um, we, it is a mixed system. We have people who are working, and, and it's similar to Germany or France, or where you have the uh, worker and the employer share in their premiums that they pay to the insurance companies. Um, and then we have our, our uh, Medicare population, people over 65 or, or people who are disabled, and uh, we guarantee them um, access to, to some coverage. Um, and then uh, there's the Native Americans and veterans and the military style, which is very similar to the uh, British or the Cuban system, uh, where we have uh, publicly funded and publicly delivered health care. And it works for those populations. But what I have to remind you about is what comes into my door every day, and those are people who are uninsured, and they are just as well off as someone in Cambodia or India, in that they have uh, catch what you can, and if they're fortunate enough to find their way to us, we will do the best we can to take care of them. Um, but these are more often than not working folks who, um, through no fault of their own, have wound up in a situation where we don't cover them. And I think they become invisible to uh, the vast majority of the public. The majority of the public has access to insurance and doesn't really grasp the struggles of those who don't have access and the impact it has on, on their, their health. So the Affordable Care Act, I have to tell you that the Affordable Care Act for us at Cook County was a godsend. Um, in, in 2010, before the, the uh, Affordable Care Act, 80% of the outpatients we saw were unfunded and 56% uh, of our inpatients were unfunded. And the, since the Affordable Care Act, it's now about 55% of all the patients we see are funded um, and 45% are unfunded. And so that gives us, that gives us uh, dollars in which to take care of people. Uh, it gives us uh, great opportunities, but it's a challenge. The Affordable Care Act still leaves millions of people who are uninsured it codifies this trend of cost sharing. And uh, what folks don't understand, and, and it's been demonstrated, the Rand Corporation has published on this back in the 70s, that co-payments, no matter how small, deter people from necessary care just as often as unnecessary care. And so the idea that someone has to have a financial skin in the game in order to make appropriate choices is a problem in this country because it results in people waiting later and presenting with more advanced and more costly disease. 
Um, and the Affordable Care Act, if nothing else, incre increased the bureaucracy of an already very complicated system. So um, the, I would say that the ACA leaves the worst features of the employment-based uh, insurance unchanged. And that means that employers can change coverage pl and plans, that uh, insurers can change provider networks, um, and that employees must accept what their employer's plan is, um, regardless of who they ha where they've been getting their care or what their expectations or needs. And there have been these plans for years that market forces are going to lower our costs. And they keep, I keep hearing this mantra that, mantra that market forces are going to make it better. Market forces are going to control costs and change the way in which health care is delivered. And the, as we look, as we've gone through and, and over the years, over the decades, um, the first thing was that fee for service is a problem. Health care costs too much in this country because the United States is enamored with fee for service. We have to do with, away with that. So we're going to do capitation because capitation will shift the risk. And that's the solution. That's going to solve the problems. Instead of uh, paying providers based on, at, like, piecework, that we would pay them a flat fee to be responsible for taking care of, of uh, a population of patients. Um, but the problem with that is that when you shift the risk, you have small um, providers, mom and pop, you know, the uh, doc down the street, um, small clinics, they can't afford the risk. They get one catastrophic illness and they have, they're out of business. And so it's resulted in massive consolidation throughout healthcare. The majority of physicians in this country today are now employed. Um, it is no longer economically feasible for most physicians to be in individual practices with the risk required uh, by the various health contracts. Um, and so what happens when you shift the risk away from the incent financial incentive to provide more care to provide less care, um, it, we now have to uh, rep provide report cards on who's doing a good job and who's not doing a good job. It's more so, like the uh, phenomenon of, of I'm going to give you a pill to counteract the side effects of the pill that I gave you before. So we're putting out report cards and risk adjustments adjustments so that we can score people that they will provide the care that we expect them to and, and not uh, uh, be lured by the incentive to give less care and allow them to make more money. So uh, I would say that in the last 20 years, market forces have increased the number of people who are insured, but also increased the number of people who are underinsured and that market forces have decreased the choice of providers, um, resulted in consolidation of HMOs. Uh, diverted healthcare resources to areas of profit rather than areas of need, and we have uh, uh, underfunding of less profitable endeavors. The case in point would be uh, behavioral health services. Everyone knows it's not very profitable to provide behavioral health services. It's not very profitable to provide um, care for folks um, who uh, need it the most often. Um, it's resulted in unaffordable prescription drugs as, as uh, big companies go gobble up small companies and we watch the price of drugs that were previously pennies go up to be dollars, tens of dollars, and sometimes hundreds of dollars. Um, and it's resulted in dissatisfaction of patients and the frustration of physicians. So, um, and I don't think that the cost of healthcare have gone down in the last 20 years that we've been looking. So, um, I, uh, welcome the discussion. I think that uh, it's important for people to understand that we're all in the same boat together. And thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Wilhelm. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm sorry, am I supposed to advance these from up here? I guess so. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm Steffi Woolhandler, and I just want to underline one thing that Dr. Fagan said, which is that um, we have a very serious problem with underinsurance in this country, that copayments and deductibles uh, mean that people have insurance that they can't afford to use. And that's true here in the state of Massachusetts, where we have 3% uninsured. It's true nationally, where we have 10% uninsured, uh, 30 million people. Um, the high deductible, this is just an example of people who have high deductible versus regular plans, okay? 
uh, women who developed breast cancer, what is the additional delay that people incur because they have the high deductible plan? Well, it turns out that the delay for bankruptcy is about two to two to three months, the delay for uh, early diagnosis is about five to seven months, and the delay for the start of chemotherapy is as much as nine months, okay? We're starting to talk about a serious situation, delaying your treatment by a week, two weeks, a month, maybe not a big deal, but to be delaying your care by an additional nine months because your insurance happens to be high deductible, speaks to an extremely serious problem that working people are facing in this country with the private health insurance system. Now I'm gonna switch away from patients here and uh, really talk about money for the rest of my time. Um, Canada does have single payer national health insurance, the United States doesn't, and the healthcare costs in the United States have risen much more rapidly as a share of GDP than those in Canada. So I think we need to, to uh, understand why that's true, because that's pretty key to understanding what the cost would be under a U.S. single payer system. Okay, administrative cost savings are a huge part of the savings in Canada. Insurance overhead, that part of the premium that goes to the insurance company never comes out to pay a doctor or a nurse or medication. Insurance overhead in the United States averages 12% within private health insurance versus 2% within US Medicare and 2% within the Canadian program, which is also called Medicare, only it's single payer. Okay, on a per capita basis, we're talking about 700, around $700 per capita, wasted every year for every man, woman, and child in this country. Hospital billing and administration. Hospitals in the United States have an average administrative cost of 25% of budget versus only 12% in Canada. So on a per capita basis, we're throwing $800 per person away on excessive hospital administrative costs related to having a multi-payer system. Duke Medical Center has 957 beds. They employ 1,600 billing clerks. Okay, uh, Cleveland Clinic was told they had to post their prices. We can't post the prices, they say. We have 210 million different prices this year. Okay, so tremendous complexity, wasting, uh, you know, a quarter of total uh, costs go to administration, half of that just wasted on this excess complexity, okay. Physicians' offices, same things. We spend a fortune on billing and compliance with payment, and we've been able to estimate that's about $400 per capita. We in the United States just throw away to have private insurance and multiple payers. Overall administrative cost differences um, are approaching $3,000 per capita. That $3,000 per capita that we could save on administrative costs is precisely the money we need to cover all Americans and to eliminate underinsurance by eliminating the gaps in private insurance that so many people bear, and then some people with uh, Medicare as well, okay? Um, so what are the costs to single payer? Well, um, I'm actually, quoting a couple of studies, one by one of our speakers today. Uh, but the first one I'm showing is the Mercatus study. It's a market-oriented think tank funded by the Koch brothers. And when they decided to cost out single payer, they said that the 5,500 U.S. hospitals would get about as much with single payer as they're now getting, about $1.1 trillion, about as much, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. The RAND people, and Jody Liu is here today to talk to us about it, again said the hospitals would get about the same amount before and after single payer, 1.1 trillion. Only the Urban Institute says that the hospitals are gonna get a big extra chunk of change. Now, I don't think that's true. Nobody intends to raise the total funding to hospitals. No one intended for each hospital to get a raise, but that's what Urban Institute said, and that's how they came up with their uh, really uh, ridiculously inflated predictions about what single payer would cost. It just came out last month. Okay, 
Now, part of the Urban Institute's high cost is, oh, there's going to be a huge surge in hospital care. As soon as we have single payer, all of us are going to run off to the hospital and beg for colonoscopies and surgeries. You know, that has never happened in the United States. We've had two major coverage expansions. We had one, um, this one I'm showing is the ACA, the most recent one. And what you'll see if you look in the middle is that hospital use did go up a little bit for poor people, less than 138% of poverty. But for more affluent people, there was a small, almost imperceptible decline in hospital use, uh, leading the United States to basically stay on its slightly downward trajectory in terms of hospital use. No surge under the ACA. Um, so we saw something very similar, I'm not going to show it, with the Medicare program in the United States. Uh, 20 million seniors got health insurance, but there was no surge in hospital use. It was absolutely flat, small increases for the elderly, small decreases, imperceptible decreases for everybody else. This is not just true for the U.S. coverage expansions. When we looked in other nations with major, these are all the OECD nations who've done major coverage expansions since World War II. Great Britain, Sweden, Canada, Finland, Canada a second time, Australia, Portugal, Greece, and Spain. None of them had a surge in utilization. It's never happened before. So this idea that Urban was pushing that everybody's going to show up at the hospital, 20% increase in hospital days is not going to happen. The, lim the limited supply of hospital beds means that that, that won't happen. Um, similarly, when we think about payments to Americans' physicians, uh, there's about a million of us, okay, and under the Mercatus projections, uh, the amount of money uh, devoted to physicians now just under $700 billion, or $700,000 per physician, now it's total, everything, overhead, not just the doctor's salary, right? $700,000 per physician. Before and after single payer, it's going to be about the same amount. And similarly, in uh, Dr. Liu's study, before and after, the payments to doctors are about the same amount. Only Urban Institute projects a giant explosion in payments to physicians. But again, does that ever happen anywhere else when you expand? Uh, expand? Uh, here again, I'm looking at uh, surge after the Affordable Care Act. In the middle, those are poor people. Yes, indeed, they increased their visits to the doctor a little bit. They got health insurance. But that was counterbalanced by a small decrease in utilization by more affluent people. And I, I was able to study it, and that really was imperceptible. The affluent people didn't know what was happening at all. So that the use of physician services, the use of the 1 million U.S. physicians, um, actually stayed the same before and after the Affordable Care Act. Again, the exact same thing was observed with the Medicare program. We in medicine are very good at triage. If we're very busy, we see our healthier patients a little less frequently. We do it all the time. We do it every year during flu season, okay? We tell our, our healthier patients, let's wait a little longer to see you. I'm very busy with new patients. So uh, that's been well documented in Canada. It's been documented in the United States. Now, what about public option? I know that's what's on everybody's mind. Uh, why don't we just include private insurers? The problem is that creates inefficiencies that will make universal health care simply unaffordable. Um, public option comes in three varieties. There's a simple buy-in, a universal coverage with a public option, and Medicare Advantage for All. I'm just going to go very briefly through them. Public option with a simple buy-in is advocated by Joe Biden. It allows individuals to buy into Medicare. If you have 8000 bucks in your pocket, you can take it out and buy Medicare. Many will remain uninsured because they don't have money in their pockets, and Medicare would become a de facto high-risk pool because the sicker people would end up in Medicare. And that actually raises costs. High-risk pools do not lower costs. They raise them. You can have universal coverage with a public option, and this has a number of names, Medicare Part E, Medicare Extra for All, or Medicare for America. It's advocated uh, by uh, Beto O'Rourke. It's advocated by Pete Buttigieg, but the original plan was written by the Center for American Progress, which is a Democratic Party think tank led by Neera Tanden, who was Hillary Clinton's issues director. So this is the centrist Democratic Party proposal, if you will. Finally, there's the idea of Medicare Advantage for All. We're going to have private HMOs 
for everyone with the premiums paid for by taxpayers. And uh, in the Medicare Advantage program, they're also called Medicare HMOs. And the only person who advocated that is uh, Kamala Harris, or the only person explicitly advocating that is Kamala Harris, okay? Um, now let's go back to the concept of Medicare Extra for all the Buttigieg O'Rourke proposal. Employers would play or pay. They would have to offer coverage or pay a payroll tax of about 8%. Anyone lacking employer-sponsored coverage would automatically be enrolled in a medicare light public option. But here's the hitch. The enrollees have to pay premiums. They have to pay co-payments just like they do with the ACA plans. You're still going to have all this under-insurance causing breast cancer care delays and all sorts of other problems. And if Medicare Advantage is continued as it is under these proposals, it will likely expand and come to predominant, predominate and traditional P fully public Medicare will become the de facto high-risk pool. Again, that raises costs to have a high-risk pool. It doesn't lower them. Um, okay, well, gee, isn't there an advantage under these public option proposals? Private people are paying for health care. It's not on the tax rolls. I just want to say that private health insurance is a tax in everything but name. You know, when I get my private health insurance, the money comes out of my paycheck before I even see it. I really don't have a choice. Terrible things will happen to me if I don't enroll in that private insurance. It is a tax in everything but name. And quibbling about is it a tax or is it a premium uh, is actually not uh, very worthwhile. And these are just some data from Saez and uh, Zuckman showing that, uh, in fact, the tax on labor in this country is very high. If you, as I recommend you do, consider your employer-sponsored premiums and your own premiums as a tax. Okay. okay, so let's talk about Medicare Advantage a little bit more. Not just about Medicare Advantage, but because it is our only working model of private plans competing with a fully pro public option, in that case, traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage enrollment has exploded despite the fact that Medicare Advantage is raising the cost to taxpayers. Uh, in this recent study by Curto, uh, it just came out, uh, actually medical care costs, the cost for the doctors and nurses and medication in traditional Medicare in blue on the left and Medicare Advantage on the right. Well, gee, Medicare Advantage spends less on doctors and hospitals, but look at what they spend for their overhead. Because the overhead is so high, we are in fact, the taxpayers are spending more for the Medicare Advantage than they are for traditional Medicare. It's raising costs. Now, how do they do this? They do this by cherry picking. They use their marketing to market to healthy people. They use network manipulation by turning away doctors who care for the sickest patients like cancer specialists. They use their benefit design, making it convenient for a routine care and extremely expensive and a big hassle if you're sick. And then they cheat, and I'm gonna show you some of this. Okay, this is Medicare Advantage enrollees within diagnoses, like comparing diabetics to diabetics, uh, asthmatics to asthmatics. Those who stayed in public Medicare had higher expenses the year before they enrolled than the Medicare Advantage enrollees had the year before they enrolled. Medicare Advantage is still effectively cherry picking the lowest cost patients uh, in order to basically uh, beat the system, okay? It's about to become impossible, impossible to prevent cherry picking. CMS and Medicare Advantage have been playing a whack-a-mole game for years where Medicare Advantage is always innovating and cherry picking and CMS sometimes tried to stop them. Uh, but currently, uh, it's about to become impossible because data from the web on all of your purchases, what's my dress size this year? Is it bigger than my dress size last year? Am I buying uh, bathroom grab bars or am I buying tennis rackets, okay? They know how healthy I am, okay? And they know whether to send me an ad or not. You cannot, you cannot prevent cherry picking uh, in the information age. There's proposed federal rules that when a patient comes to me and say, I want to download my entire medical record to an app, I cannot say no. I download their record to an app. It no longer has any privacy protections, and that data can be bought and sold. Uh, and finally, Google. Google, okay, who's 
the world's expert in targeting ads based on your information. Google just bought a health insurance company, Oscar. They're a major investor in Oscar. It's a New York-based company that's going into the Medicare Advantage business. So unless we completely change the way we disseminate information and privacy in this country, it's impossible to prevent cherry-picking based on marketing going forward. Okay. It's also been impossible to prevent lemon dropping. People get sick. They get dropped from their plan. You can do this by network manipulation, benefit design, and hassle factor. Again, here's the evidence. Uh, when people are in Medicare Advantage plans, they get sick. They dis disenroll. They get dropped at four times the rate of people with low needs. Uh, how do we do it? It's a bit of a black box, but this may be part of it. Follow the black line. That is the share of Medicare Advantage programs now charging 20% coinsurance for chemo. That means coinsurance is not a copayment. Coinsurance is a percentage of the bill. This means if you get $100,000 worth of chemo, which is what chemo costs, $100,000, you're going to pay $20,000 in coinsurance. Okay. That's an invitation for people with cancer to leave your plan. Lemon dropping. Okay. Finally, cheating. CMS has sometimes tried to top to stop cheating, not always. Uh, nonetheless, Medicare Advantage programs upcode. They exaggerate how sick their patients are in order to collect the higher risk-based premiums. Um, just to give you an idea, HMO means uh, a Medicare plan that employs their doctors in this particular study. So in that type of Medicare Advantage plan, they have 16% upcoding, 16% upcoding the first year, which is the equivalent, the risk equivalent of 97% of all their enrollees newly becoming diabetic. Obviously, that cannot be true. That's cheating. That's exaggerating how sick the patients are. Uh, and finally, when push comes to shove, Medicare Advantage programs have been shown to just lie. They get bonuses for quality. This particular quality measure is their uh, readmissions rate for congestive heart failure, MI, and pneumonia. They report their rates are lower than the, white, than the average, right? You know, we've lower uh, CHF admissions than the average, but when you go and audit it, in fact, their readmissions are higher. They just lie. And this is actually the second time they've been caught uh, as a group cheating on these quality measures. Finally, I just, I'm sorry it's getting long, but just there were ACA had co-ops. They were put into the plan at the last minute as a public option light. Uh, they were nonprofits. They were supposed to be consumer focused. 2.4 billion in federal loans went to the co-ops. 24 of them got started up. Only four of them survived, and you've never heard of them because there's only 150,000 Americans enrolled in them. So there was an effort to do a public option light through these nonprofit co-ops. They all went under. Uh, examples of why the high cost exchange enrollees flocked to the co-ops. 98% uh, of all HIV patients in Iowa ended up in the co-op because they had low co-payments. They're community-oriented, right? Uh, in New York City, uh, dozens of cancer patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, ended up in the co-op because it was the only exchange plan that covered care there. And obviously, if you're attracting sick patients by giving them good benefits, you're going to go under as our co-ops did, which is exactly what will happen. Good luck, guys finish last in the health insurance market. So public option will create much higher costs. There'll be less savings on insurance overhead. There'll be multiple payers, so there'll be no administrative savings for hospitals or doctors. Private insurers will shift costs and their high-cost patients onto the public option via cherry-picking, lemon-dropping, cheating, and then they can shadow price, raise their own prices to just below the public option, raising costs for everyone. Consequently, you're going to have higher system-wide costs that assures political pressure for benefit cuts. Finally, one last slide. Um, most favor uh, phasing out private plans if they can keep their doctor or hospital. This is the only uh, poll I could find that looked at this, and again, we have a polling expert in the room, maybe she can help us. But if you ask Americans, do you support Medicare for all, no further description, uh, about 56%, 53%, I think was showing, uh, say they support it. If you say, do you want Medicare for all, but you uh, lose your choice of 
insurance. Well, in fact, the support drops down into the 40s. But if you turn around and say, do you want Medicare for all if you have no choice of insurance but you get to keep your doctor in hospital? In fact, the support rises for Medicare for all to 55% or higher than it was originally. So there's a lot of confusion out there, uh, but I think if we're able to communicate to the American people what a real single paper would be like, uh, there would in fact be tremendous support. Thanks. That should stimulate some discussion. Mr. Moffat. Okay. Well, as Monty Python once said, now for something entirely different. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Dean Gallio, uh, for the invitation. Um, what you've heard uh, uh, from the previous speakers is what's wrong with the current system. And the fact of the matter is, I'm here to tell you that merely op opposition opposition to a single-payer system does not automatically translate into a defense of the status quo. Having said that further, I would like to state for the record that in terms of this debate, I have profound respect uh, for Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Representative Jamila uh, Pramilia uh, Jayapal of Washington State uh, who are sponsoring the major single-payer bills in Congress, uh, S. 1129 and H.R. 1384, they deserve a great deal of credit for setting down in black and white uh, their detailed uh, prescriptions of how they would actually change the healthcare system, and they do so with crystal clarity. Uh, what we've heard from our previous speakers is, of course, that uh, we are going to, we talked about high aspirations, and they, those are high aspirations. Um, single-payer advocates envision a universal program of publicly financed health care that is uh, more fair, more equitable, uh, economically, much more economical, much more efficient, and all those within the borders of the United States and uh, its territories would be able uh, to secure uh, health care benefits uh, and services as a legal right, and they would enjoy a system uh, that would ultimately deliver higher quality uh, care, superior medical outcomes. Now, I acknowledge up front the very powerful emotional appeal of this proposal. The idea of free care for all at the point of service, comprehensive coverage, no deductibles, no co-payments, no premiums, no messy managed care networks sounds actually quite great, actually. Um, and no high administrative cost, of course. Uh, Steffi makes a point of this. Uh, they promise to liberate us from the complexity of the current system, and that's a fact. They certainly do in that sense. And they offer, they say, uh, serious, no-nonsense, uh, government-enforced cost control. Well, health policy is not only a choice of competing visions, but it also involves balancing competing goods, calibrating the imposition of public cost and, and private cost, the provision of public benefits, and the maintenance of personal liberties. If we decide, at the end of the day, to turn the health care system over ultimately to Congress, if Congress is going to exercise control over the health care sector of the American economy, then I think we also have to be prepared to accept certain consequences, certain hard realities. Um, there are high aspirations and congressional declarations are pretty, uh, are, are lofty, uh, their goals are lofty, uh, but as you all know, good intentions are never really sufficient. In the case of a single payer proposal, I think you have to ask yourself, going beyond the problems that exist in the current system, which in fact are undoubtedly true, there are many problems in the current system, you have to ask yourself, really, well, if we do this, if we centralize all decision making in the House and Senate, ultimately that's what we're talking about, uh, how will this actually work out in practice? Um, will individuals uh, and families actually um, Will they actually see a reduction in their health care cost? Even if, in fact, their premiums and deductions go away, will their taxes actually be higher, ultimately negating uh, what uh, they thought they would get in terms of personal household savings? Uh, how are doctors and nurses and medical professionals, uh, how are they actually going to be paid 
what will actually take place with regard to the reimbursement of doctors and hospitals and clinics and nurses and so on. And where do persons go, really, if they do not or cannot get the care they want or need uh, from a single government program? Now, I know, and so do you, that we all favor expanded access uh, to care. Universal access to care is actually a worthy and desirable goal. The reality is that universal coverage in and of itself will not guarantee you universal access to care, let alone high quality care for all persons who need it, when they need it, and under the circumstances they need it. Uh, if healthcare is a legal right, uh, meaning universal government entitlement, free at the point of service for 327 million Americans, then it is, uh, for all practical purposes, what economists call a free good. Consumers of a free good will behave as if the good were free, whether or not it's free. But if health care is indeed a free good, then, of course, the economic demand for the free good is unlimited. The problem is, when unlimited demand clashes with limited supply, that means that someone, in this case, government officials, not doctors, not patients, but government officials, are going to have to make big decisions about who gets care, when they get care, how they get care, and under what circumstances they get care. These key decisions uh, in such a system are inevitably going to be political decisions, not necessarily uh, medical decisions or even normal economic decisions. They are going to be political decisions. Uh, Rationing is inevitable in any system. Uh, we know that, and I think Steffi has pointed that out, I think, very well, and so has Dr. Fagan. But the fact is, is that what we are talking about here is we are talking about the trans, trans, uh, basically a transition or a transformation of all the key decisions in the healthcare system over uh, to the political leaders in Washington, D.C. I think, given their general performance, even if you are very firmly convinced that this will ultimately be a better system, I think this idea should give you pause uh, in any event. Uh, serious cost control. Can we actually get serious con cost control in the system? Well, the reality is, is that members of Congress, uh, political officials, ultimately not, can't control the demand for anything. They can only control the supply. And how do they control the supply? Well, there are many ways of doing that. You can do it with a global budget. You can do it with administrative payment. You can do it with price controls. You can do it with payment reductions. Uh, at the end of the day, that's the way health care costs are going to be controlled. Now, we are doing this to some extent in Medicare right now. And the consequence is Medicare is quite viable, largely because we have a massive cost shift from the Medicare program into the private sector that is also picking up Medicare costs. If you look at the Affordable Care Act, which passed back in 2010, um, there was no question about it. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, and members of the Congress wanted to slow the growth of healthcare spending. And in order to slow the growth of healthcare spending, they wanted to bend the cost curve downward. And one mechanism of doing that was to establish new payment rules in the Medicare program, and most particularly in Medicare Part A, which would result in payment reductions over time. Well, today, CBO says those payment reductions over time are about $800 billion over the next 10 years and stretching out onto the future. Well, the Medicare trustees tell us, and I'll read it to you, from the 2019 Medicare trustees report, they say, by 2040, simulations suggest approximately 40% of hospitals, roughly two-thirds of skilled nursing facilities, and nearly 80% of home health agencies would have negative total facility margins, raising the possibility of access and quality of care issues for Medicare beneficiaries. Single-payer advocates aspire to a system where America as a whole will actually be spending less on health care than we do today that we will uh, bend the health, the health care uh, cost curve downwards. And you know, <clears throat> Steffi mentioned a number of uh, independent analysts. I mean, the, the Urban Institute and, of course, Mercatus and others. Uh, but the Urban Institute recently came out, uh, just actually last week. This is actually a very recent uh, study. 
They said, looking at what we are going to spend over the next 10 years, well, they say 2020 to 2029, under current law, we're expected to spend uh, 50, $52 trillion. They expect, with moving into a single-payer system, that we would uh, uh, add uh, about $34 trillion in increased federal spending over that period. Uh, private spending and other government spending would decrease significantly, of course. People would no longer be paying premiums and so on. Uh, would decrease by $27 trillion but the result would be a total increase of overall spending by about $7 trillion. Uh, the RAND Corporation, the RAND study, in fact, our colleague here, uh, Ms. Liu, has uh, also participated in this, and they indicate that, well, you know, if you look at the actual data, we're going to spend more on healthcare under a single-payer system uh, rather than less. They, and, the, and the range is between a 1.8% increase, is that correct, in the first year? up to 9.8% increase, depending upon meeting the full demand. Is that correct? Right. So the idea that we're going to ultimately bend the cost curve and spend, you know, spend less, I think is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a real deep wish on the part of the single-payer advocates for that result. At the end of the day, the debates between the Urban Institute and the Rand Corporation and Mercatus <clears throat> the hard reality is those debates will be long forgotten by the time this debate actually takes place in Congress. And at that point, the Congressional Budget Office will be forced to, rate, to, to weigh in and do the kind of comprehensive analysis that the Con Congressional Budget Office is charged with doing in scoring legislation that is to be uh, determined by the Congress or to be enacted by the Congress. Frankly, I think uh, it would be a great service for the Congressional Budget Office to actually start to weigh in a lot earlier than the debate that is going to, than, than a, a future debate. A comprehensive COB, CBO report, um, right, would really add, add to the quality of the national debate. Um, what about individuals and families? Will households really see a reduced cost? Well, that all depends upon what the tax rates will actually be. The Urban Institute came out this week and said there will be a 70% tax increase. That is a revenue increase. That's enormous, actually. The question is, Senator Warren says, well, this will be, this will be uh, confined primarily to upper income folks. Um, it will not necessarily be a middle, middle class uh, tax increase. I think, you know, this is again where Senator Sanders is actually deserves a great deal of credit because Senator Sanders has made it very, very clear uh, any tax increase to do the kind of thing uh, that we are talking about doing, creating a national single-payer program to replace all of, practically all other government programs and all private health insurance is going to be a massive undertaking. And uh, he himself has said, well, we are going to have to have a broad-based tax increase, a 4% uh, income tax, roughly, and then a 7.5% premium tax. Now, we've only had one tax analysis on this, and that was actually quite some time ago, 2016, when Ken Thorpe did the study of the Sanders plan. And he, Ken Thorpe indicated that, no, this broad-based tax increase is going to start to hit a lot of folks, everybody. 71% of, uh, of all Americans would have effectively be affected by increased taxation. For some people, it's going to be pretty... Uh, it's going to be pretty significant. People on, on uh, uh, in terms of health care costs, uh, people on Medicaid now virtually pay virtually nothing, and people who are in the ACA exchanges at the lower end of the of the income scale are very heavily subsidized. Uh, so we we uh, we don't know exactly what the tax impact will be. Part of the problem is as good as, as clear as both of the House and Senate bills are with regard to actually how they would structure the health care system. Neither of them, neither of them, have any financing provisions at all. Neither the House bill nor the Senate bill, so we really don't actually know. Um, <laughs> the loudest noise in the debate is the dog that doesn't bark. Um, I would simply close by saying, <clears throat> The argument, again, over the future of the American healthcare system is at bottom, uh, so certainly it's a, it's, a, it's a debate about 
uh, competing visions. And there's no question uh, that the status quo is profoundly flawed. The health care healthcare in the United States is too costly. It's far more costly than, than is necessary. Uh, the insurance markets are a mess. They're consolidated. They're uncompetitive. Consumer choice and competition are frustrated. Performance on quality measures is very uneven, largely dependent upon whether or not uh, you are in a very, very uh, strong uh, employer-based plan, a corporate plan, or if you are in Medicaid, you're in a very, very different situation, frankly. And so, and the same thing is true depending upon your geographic location. If you're in a geographic area uh, that is medically underserved, um, you have a lot of problems. You have, you know, there's no question about it. At the same time, there are bright spots. Just remember that. The United States is still the leader in medical science and technology. We do a great job in training doctors and nurses and medical professionals. We are the leaders of the, of the, frankly, the leaders of the world in research and development in medical science and technology. Um, and we've made terrific strides in certain areas. We lead the world in terms of survivability from heart disease and cancer. We do better than everybody else. And even despite the fact that we have dysfunctional markets, and Steffi has made that point, and you will hear this point made over and over again correctly. They are dysfunctional. But there are still bright spots even there. And those bright spots are, there, are the fact that there are still economic efficiencies in care delivery, largely absent in other countries. We have shorter lengths of hospital stays, and that's not simply because people are trying to jump them out. We actually do a pretty good job in many of those areas. We have more outpatient services, and we have a greater use of generic drugs. Having said that, I'd be the first one to say, we've got a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we don't have to destroy everything in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's just terrific to be with you here today, to be able to talk with you a little bit about the um, perspectives from a medical society uh, perspective and organized medicine. So I'm Marianne Bomba. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Medical Society. And the Medical Society in Massachusetts represents over 25,000 physicians and medical students, as well as we um, own the New England Journal of Medicine. So there's a, a breadth of educational mission in our society, as well as advocacy, as well as a, a social mis mission. Our, our, our overarching mission at the Medical Society is advancement of the public's health. So with that, I hope to be able to share with you some perspectives on single health, uh, single payer rather health care um, uh, from the perspective of organized medicine and perhaps look at the cultural and ethical pieces of this that we have discussed as a medical society uh, going forward. So I love this picture. It's called the Momentum. And these are wildebeests in Africa. And every year, they, they, they're a stand in a metaphor for I think what's happening in healthcare right now. Every year, the wildebeests have a mass migration about 1,000 kilometers across the Serengeti to go from where they were living very happily. One day, they just suddenly get up and they march uh, across the Serengeti to greener pastures, better grass, in order to have a better life for the majority of their herd. In that process, some of them do die, some of them don't make it, some of them choose not to go. But um, ultimately, they move forward, going through water, all kinds of uh, nature perils, to eventually, hopefully, get to where they'll live better, longer, as, as a herd. No one knows exactly why they do this. The grass was fine where they were, and they go to another set of grass. But it is, I guess, what they thought was the right thing to do. So I put this picture up here in these two days because on these two days, very important things happened that we think is the right thing to do. On May 4th, 2019, policy was passed at our medical society. And then June 11th, policy was passed at the AMA. And I'd like to tell you about it. So uh, 
in May, the Medical Society passed really groundbreaking policy, the first state medical society in this country, to embrace the fact that health, including health care, is a basic human right. That is very significant because if this is our compass, if this is our North Star, it helps us develop all of our policy, all of our work going forward. The second part of our policy was the provision of health care services as well as optimizing the social determinants of health, the drivers of health, is an ethical obligation of a civilized society. So with this as our North Star, our compass, our, our, the, the guiding principle by which we go forward, it helps us look at items such as single payer as, an, as, an, as organized medicine. So our current policy on health insurance coverage in the, on the medical society is, is big. I mean, there are seven pieces here. I'd like to focus on those that are highlighted. And these are the highlighted pieces. That we will work toward universal insurance coverage which is very important that all people are covered. We also believe in a non-disruptive and evolutionary process that includes quality and public health components. Now this again, I know we've talked a little bit about can we continue to be non-disruptive and wait for evolutionary? I don't know that answer, but our, our new principles will help us with that. Collaboration across all healthcare segments, including employers, health plans, healthcare organizations, legislators, and the administrators for the state. We need to collaborate across all of our segments, integrate our healthcare better. And then we also believe a single healthcare reform as an option is something that we can embrace as well. In summary, taking all those pieces together, we believe a pluralistic approach to health insurance re reform is supported that includes the option of single payer. So what are some of the considerations here when you look at you know, pluralistic, single payer, public option? Well, um, again, keeping our North Star there, we try to look at, okay, what will be best for all? We look at our current situation right now pluralistic, we think, great, it's competition here, this choice. The competition is there to help with quality. Well, we really don't have the highest quality health care uh, in the world, and has it really achieved what we hoped it would achieve? Do we really have choice when you look at the fact that we have networks in place or that you look at where, you know, there may be patients who cannot access care when they need it or have to travel long distances to be able to get to um, a, a provider within the network. Choice is not really there. If you look at lower cost, well, that's not really true. We have one of the highest cost healthcare systems in the world. You look at access. Access is problematic. I work in a community health center, for example. Some of my patients have to go 40, 50 miles to be able to see a provider within their network. You look at equity, and I think this is, this is where we look at the ethical piece of this. Do we really give the same care, the same opportunity for care, the same address drivers of care equally across our system as it's presently designed? And then administrative burden. This year we're really going to break all kinds of records and look like we're going to be spending $450 billion on administrative burden. It's, it's significant. You look at a single payer, we think, okay, there, we'll have coordination, integration of care. Would be helpful, would be good. Lower that cost. That could very much happen if you look at the cost associated with administrative burden. In, that's much, much less with a single payer. You look at access. Again, if everyone's able to access care across state lines, across employers, across healthcare facilities, that would be a real win. You look at equity, everyone's receiving the same care from the, from the hopefully the physician that they want to or the healthcare systems they want to. And then you look at administrative burden. Again, it should be lower single payer. Going to public option. Here, again, there's competition. So does competition help? It certainly may, will help an industry stay in place, the insurance industry. 
But does, it also com does competition also help with quality, um, being able to compete on quality and, and do things better? Public option might give us choice. In other words, we are able to choose to have different types of insurance should we want that. Public option could also give us portability across, hopefully across state lines or should we move or change jobs. There could be lower costs with a public option or certainly the, th the thought is it would drive lower costs um, with that competition. That it would help with access and help with equity there as well where, pe where persons can choose to where they want to receive care and from whom they want to receive care as well as re receive the care that they need. As we talk about all of this though, it is very important that we make sure our definitions are clear. When we look at Medicare for all, it sounds simplistic. Oh, it's just Medicare, what my grandmother has. Um, as someone who chooses the Medicare plan for her patient, for her, excuse me, parents every year, I will tell you Medicare as designed is incredibly complex. Part A has co deductibles and coinsurance, and there's no max on what you can pay. I mean, you could reach a point where you start, you're not covered at all. Part B, again, if you dare risk getting Part B without having a Medigap policy, then you look at, okay, if you go to Medicare Part C, then you know there's Medicare Advantage program. Within Medicare Advantage, there are, in our state, probably 30 different types of plans you can get for Medicare Advantage. You have to choose which one you know you might work best for your, your yourself or someone that you love or you care for. Then you go to Medicare Part D with the um, uh, medications. Again, a, a huge cost. It's very, very complex. Even Medicare Part B, where you have the Medicare Medigap policies there, they're complex in and of themselves. I mean, honestly, I don't know how anyone goes through this. I do it with my parents and I am just stunned at how complex, uncoordinated, um, confusing, I just have no idea how anyone navigates the Medicare system if they're really trying to look at it from a, a global um, perspective on what's covered, what's not, how do I get what's best for me and my needs. Single payer definition, very, very important here as well. What does this mean? Is it single payer in a state? Well, what does that mean? So if you go, if you leave your state, are you covered in another state? Does single payer need to be a national priority, not a state priority in order to do this better? So I think we have a lot of definitional issues that we have to address going forward. And then public option, the same here. What does this mean? You know, is this, the, do we already have this in place? For example, in Massachusetts with our with our connector, we were able to go on there and, and, and through the public connector and find a policy that, that we, we like. Is that really, is that public option? Uh, what, what is this public option? What does this mean? I think we have failed in defining these um, terms and therefore when conversations occur in the uh, political domain or even personal domains, nobody really knows what, what one is talking about. So I think that to understand these well, uh, will help us number, first of all, to be able to have conversations where we can find solutions going forward. So very, very important to, to have these definitions clear. And then some critical considerations to think about as we move toward uh, whatever health system design we hope to have in the future that will in fact provide care and, the, and address the drivers of care as well as care services. The first is acceptance by healthcare systems. You know, we can have single payer, we could have um, a public option, and have health systems, physician practices, uh, you know, agencies not take that coverage. And I think this is where we really run into a concern is that we may find that, for example, right now in our own state, Medicaid is not universally accepted by all physician practices. Large healthcare systems and hospitals do have to take Medicaid, but the ambulatory practices do not. They, they can opt out of taking Medicaid. They could do the same for Medicare. So what, what equity is there here? You know, uh, will, will we have coverage? Will there, we be developing um, a two-tiered system? What, what will happen from this? So I think these are very important cultural um, and ethical questions we have to address as we look at single payer and what, what the collateral issues are that could come about because of this. 
stigma. Again, uh, how do we make sure that that's not attached to the um, payment system that may, we may put in place? We see this already with Medicaid. Uh, many, many, again, practices will not take Medicaid. My, I have Medicaid patients who, if they need medication-assisted therapy, they need to travel 50 miles to get care because of the way their coverage is designed and to find someone who will take their insurance. So very, very concerning. Creation of a tiered system. This has happened in other countries. Even when you have national health insurance, you develop a tier that's private. So is that okay with us? Is, is this equity? Is this, is, this, is this fair? Is this what we want to go toward? In our country, what's the impact on medical education and gradu graduate medical education training as well? Right now, Medicare CMS pays for approximately $15 billion a year, contributes $15 billion a year to this training. What will happen? Will that change? We have to, we have to there's a lot of pieces to this to look at. And then finally, we need to have informed and committed healthcare leadership. Leadership is, is so important as we drive change to set that vision for the future. You know, we look at um, our health, for example, in, in Massachusetts, our board of trustees and our house of delegates setting the vision for the physicians in Massachusetts that in fact health, including health care, is a basic human right. Then taking that in June to the AMA, which adopted the same policy. So we now have two huge organized medicine groups that embrace health, including health care, as a basic human right. And we have a wonderful opportunity to be able to take this and go forward with a health system design and an insurance payment design that can actually accomplish what we have set as a goal. But we have to be very thoughtful in this process and be able to think through all of the other um, constructs that we've put around this already and be either willing to change them as well or look very differently at the process. So with that, I will stop and I really look forward to your discussion and questions later. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jody Liu. I'm a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. For those of you who aren't familiar, RAND is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute that's focused on using evidence based analysis to inform decision making and policies. So, a lot of the work that I do is related to modeling healthcare reform, and um, we've done studies looking at how much will single payer cost that Dr. Wolhander and Mr. Moffat have referenced. And so um, I don't have slides today. I'm not going to show um, any of the numbers um, for a couple of reasons. But I really want to focus today thinking about why are all of these estimates so different? There are several organizations and individuals who have put out these estimates. Why are they so different? And are they, so are they useful because they're so different? So these um, estimates are different for a couple of reasons. First, the single payer isn't just one proposal, right? There's multiple proposals. There are multiple bills now, the Sanders bill in Congress now, um, and the Jayapal bill. These are not the same Medicare for all proposals. There are a lot of different key considerations, and that makes modeling them hard. So it's difficult to compare the apples to apples here when the proposals themselves aren't the same. So it's obvious, but it needs to be said because often we're talking about these things as if it's one thing. So things like the provider payment rates is a really important characteristic, but in the Sanders bill, they would be paid fee for service. In Jayapal, they'd be global budgets. That's a huge difference, and it would have different cost implications. There's also a lot of things in these kind of bills that aren't specified. So there's the financing side. Sometimes there's a financing plan, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there's some taxes specified, but not the rates, not the schedule. So how can we say anything about who's paying more, who's paying less without those details? So for modelers, when we're making these decisions, we have to make some decision about it and put it into the model. And as a result, our estimates are going to be different. So when you're seeing these kind of estimates out there, it's really important to be clear about what people are modeling and what kind of assumptions are they putting into these models. And then the hardest ones are the assumptions about what's actually going to happen. How are these plans going to be implemented? What um, will the responses be to changes in provider payment? What are doctors and hospitals going to do? What are consumers going to do? And these are, these are big assumptions that need to be made in order to make any sort of a model. And any sort of cost estimates that you see are really driven by these choices. 
So why is it, so why do we do this modeling if um, they can be so different? Um, in particular for this topic, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the estimates because we just don't really know exactly what will happen. And I think that's an important thing to recognize and to be a good consumer of these estimates. And it also really does inform kind of these aspirations and realities because I think it points out where are the key drivers, where are the key decisions that we need to be thinking about when we're designing policies like this. So for the RAND analysis that we do, um, we do strive to try to make it as evidence-based as possible. So we look to the literature. We talk to different policy experts about uh, what they think, uh, what um, past experience with smaller reforms with, in different countries, how does that inform the estimates? And we come up with an estimate. What we also do, which tends to not get as much headline, is that we do a lot of sensitivity analysis. We have a bunch of alternative assumptions that we put in, and we say, okay, if this changes, if you think that this um, plan would be implemented in a different way, what would it look like? And so anytime we have a report out, we have a kind of our headline number, but then we have a bunch of other scenarios that we do. And I think it's really important to, it, it can't be underscored more, that any sort of estimate like this has uncertainty, and we should um, be looking into that. So what do we know for sure for, for single payer? I think one thing is that for sure that a single payer system is converting from what we have now into a government run insurance program. So federal spending goes up by design. And I think often in the discussions, there's discussion about federal spending and national spending. Federal spending will go up because it is a, a government run program. National spending, it could go up and or, or down depending on uh, different assumptions that are going into the model. And I think that's a key difference that often gets uh, confused. So for national spending, I think an aspiration would be that automatically you put in a single payer system and there would be savings or, or increased costs because there are people who believe in either side. This is um, something that would be, I think, hard, hard to do. It is a big change from what we currently have. So if you have um, any sort of savings, it needs to come from reduction in prices, so that's reduced um, revenues for our doctors and hospitals, or reduced drug prices. The price either needs to come down or the quantity needs to come down, and that can be um, done, done in different ways. But those are hard choices to make. And so I think the, the reality is that these things could happen with any of these single-payer plans, but it really depends on how they're implemented and what the uh, policy decisions are after um, any sort of bill like this would be passed. So the other big area that people wonder about is who's paying for this? So on the financing side, I think what is clear is that this would be a big redistribution of who's paying for healthcare. So what we currently have in the system now with private premiums, with out-of-pocket payments, with people in Medicare and Medicaid, it's a fragmented system with several different payment streams. When we go to a single-payer system, um, usually these plans are tax financed, so it depends on what those taxes look like. But um, in the end, there are going to be winners and losers because it's just such a large change. I think it is an aspiration to say that you could only tax the wealthy and um, have enough funding to, to cover um, everyone, um, but in the end, it'll depend on what those, um, those taxes look like. So with all these variations in the type of estimates that are out there, I think it's really important to be transparent about the assumptions that are going into a model and as consumers of that, to, um, to look for that, to, to understand and see what you believe because there is truly uncertainty in, in some of these decisions. And then um, really recognizing that when we design these kind of policies, it isn't just end with the proposal. There's a lot of work that needs to happen after to make sure that uh, these sort of uh, plans actually get implemented as intended and um, really recognize that the, there would be hard decisions that would need to be made if the savings in terms of costs would be realized. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Really happy to be here. I'm Liz Hamill. I'm from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And for those of you who aren't familiar with KFF, we are not a foundation and we're not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente. We're an independent, nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan research and information organization. Um, and so I head up the public opinion and survey research team there. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about what the public thinks about all of this. Um, and, you know, before I tell you what the public thinks, let me just start by saying I don't think 
you know, public opinion doesn't tell us always the right answer when it comes to something particularly as complicated as healthcare policy, but it is important to understand where the public stands. Um, sometimes it shows you where leadership is necessary, where the public doesn't have a complete understanding of things. It also lets you know what the constraints are, um, because if something is really unpopular with the public, that makes it a lot more difficult to implement that kind of change. Um, so starting with the most basic question of whether people think the government ought to be involved in making sure people have health insurance at all, this is uh, data not from my own polls, but from Gallup and the Pew Research Center. And you can see starting around 2000, you know, a solid majority of people said yes, it is the government's responsibility to make sure that most people have health insurance. Uh, but if you look at what happens right around the time that President Obama was elected and the ACA was passed, re responses on this question changed and the public was more divided. And so this is happening in the context of a highly politicized law that itself was branded as a government takeover of health care. Um, but then we saw sort of a rebound following the election of Donald Trump and the failed ACA repeal efforts, we saw that go back to about 60% again, saying it is the government's responsibility uh, to make sure people have health coverage. Uh, at the same time, however, and this is just the Gallup data on that question, so it goes from 2001 to 2017, and you can see what happens to partisanship on this question over time. So this was a time period that was characterized by widening partisan gaps on, among the public on many issues, but it was particularly striking on health care given the bitter partisan fight over the ACA. So back in 2001, there was about a 30 percentage point gap between the share of Republicans and the share of Democrats saying, yes, the federal government should make sure everyone has health insurance. But by 2017, that widened to 60 percentage points. So that tells you something a little bit about the environment we're operating in now. So turning to the more specific question of whether people support a single payer plan, we've been asking about variations of this for a long time, going back to 1998. And between 1998 and 2009, we never really saw a majority saying that they supported a single government plan. Um, <clears throat> But in 2016, as the idea of a single player plan once again became uh, part of the national discussion, largely due to Bernie Sanders, uh, we saw that support had ticked up to about 50%. So one of the things that happened around 2016, you know, this wasn't the first time that the phrase Medicare for all had been used, but it really was when a national single payer plan started being talked about as Medicare for all rather than single payer. Um, you can see what happens, you know, the wording really does matter. We heard a lot about we need, you know, some definitions, um, but the public really perceives these things quite differently. Um, so universal health coverage is a very popular idea. Medicare for all is a very popular idea. So 63% of the public say they have a positive association with this. You know, Medicare itself is a very popular program, and so using that phrasing, um, you know, was, was a wise move among the advocates of this type of plan, whereas single payer is something that is not really very well understood by the public. You know, about half say they have a positive reaction to it, but a significant number of people say, I'm not sure what that means. I don't really have an opinion on it. Um, so since 2017, we've been tracking this question using the wording Medicare for all as it's become part of the public debate. And our polls found a solid majority in support of this uh, throughout 2018 and early 2019. Um, however, in recent months, as Medicare for All has gotten more attention in the Democratic presidential primary debates, and some of the Democratic candidates have kind of gone on the attack against Medicare for All, we have seen a softening of that support and an increase in uh, opposition. So our latest poll that was released just the week before last found a more of a narrow split, so 51% in support and 47% opposed. So, of course, it won't be any surprise that there's a partisan division on this question, and most Democrats are in support of this kind of plan, most, Demo uh, most Republicans are opposed. I think it is notable at this point, though, that the energy right now leans somewhat in the opposition, so we see six in ten Republicans say they're strongly opposed to this type of plan. Somewhat smaller share of Democrats say they're strongly in favor. Um, so in, it will probably also come as no surprise to anyone in this room that Medicare for All is poorly understood by the public. 
So the one thing that people do seem to understand is that taxes for most people would increase. Um, and about six in 10 also you know, think that this type of plan would mean that all US residents would have health coverage. Uh, but at the same time, uh, a, a, a majority of people think that uh, employers and individuals would continue to pay insurance premiums. Most also think they'd continue to pay deductibles and co-pays, although a lot of the plans out there would eliminate this cost sharing. And then, if I can get the, my animation to work. There we go. <laughs> um, so majorities of people also believe that people with employer plans and, uh, and people who buy their own coverage would be able to keep the coverage they have now. So that's pretty clearly out of step with how a single payer plan would work. And in fact, this confusion is even greater among people who support this type of plan. So among people who said they're in favor of Medicare for all, two thirds believe that they would be able to keep the, the insurance that they have now. So there's a fair amount of confusion out there. So given this confusion, it's not surprising that rather than being firm, public support for a Medicare for All plan is quite malleable, and it really depends on the type of messaging that's emphasized. Um, so Dr. Wolhander showed some of this type of polling. We've done a lot of different kind of message testing, and here we read people different arguments, both in support of and against a Medicare for All plan, and you can see that we can push that net support, so that's the favor minus oppose, as high as 45% or 45 percentage points when you say, what if you heard it would guarantee health insurance as a right for all Americans? What if you heard that it would eliminate this, these out-of-pocket costs? It pushes support much higher. We can also push it much lower, so as low as negative 44% when we say, well, what if you hear it could lead to delays for certain people seeking treatments? So, you know, this is an oversimplification of what would really happen in a public debate, but it kind of shows you where those pressure points are for the public on both the negative and the positive sides. Um, so we also heard about some of these more incremental approaches, the public option, Medicare and Medicaid buy-ins. Um, all In our polling, all of these start out as much more popular than Medicare for all. Uh, most of them also have at least slim majority support among Republicans. Um, but I will say I'm not going to go through all the data, but we um, have also done you know, message testing on the public option. And we see that these types of plans are also malleable depending on which aspects of them you emphasize for people. Um, finally, we've seen a divide between candidates on the Democratic side right now between those who would push for Medicare for all and those who say they want to expand on the ACA to cover more people and lower costs. At this point, this is a poll we did among Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents, and we find that more uh, potential Democratic voters at this point say they would prefer a candidate who wants to expand on the ACA rather than one who wants to replace the ACA with Medicare for All. Um, and when we ask those who do prefer a Medicare for All candidate if they would only vote for a Medicare for All candidate, that's about 14%. Um, you know, it's a long way till the election. A lot could happen between now and then, but that's where the Democrat, potential Democrat electorate stands at this point. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So I would invite all of the panelists up to uh, the podium and uh, for chairs, and uh, here begins the fun with the questions. Um, so you've been given a lot of information, clearly. Um, and um, there is a lot of different analysis going on. The whole idea of universal coverage be versus a single payer. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have near universal coverage with 97.5 percent of uh, the population being covered, but under a Medicaid expansion uh, program. So the first uh, question I have for the panel as uh, the audience prepares its question is, uh, the ACA was signed into law in, uh, nearly a decade ago significantly expanding the government's role in uh, the U.S. healthcare system, mainly through Medicaid expansion. What have we learned uh, that should inform the way forward? Dr. Fagan? Okay. Go, go. It's on. 
Uh, okay. So uh, one of the things that uh, happened with Medicaid expansion, um, actually one of the problems we found with Medicaid expansion is that uh, peop we took a, a population that had not had exposure or had dealt with insurance before, and we put them in a managed care plan. So they had no familiarity with uh, those rules, and uh, it's been um, really a problem throughout the uh, country in terms of you take a population, um, suddenly has access to care, and you expect them to stay in a network, and you expect them to um, get care, and, and, and it's uh, resulted in a, in a lot of problems and difficulty, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of uh, managed care entities have gotten out of the business because they found that it was not financially sustainable for them. Uh, to manage the, the care of this population. Um, actually, I think that it was kind of foolhardy to believe that we would uh, balance the budget or actually save money on the most, uh, on a very small percentage of the mm -hmm. population that had a lot of needs and um, needed a lot more services than we were able to provide for them. So it's, it's been very problematic. I, I'm impressed that you know Massachusetts has, has done so well in terms of having so many people uh, covered. That has not been the case in, in Illinois, um, where we still have significant number of people who are, are, are not covered. And um, those folks who, who are, um, had to purchase uh, coverage, uh, purchase uh, care on the exchanges, uh, found it also unsustainable. So uh, it's been very problematic the way in which it was done. Dr. Bombach, you have a comment? Sure, just a, a comment on that. The, um, having access to insurance does not mean you have access to care. And I think that we have to be, as, as we talk about learning from the Medicaid expansion, that when we have groups, um, be it health systems based on their leadership or be, uh, that will not accept Medicaid patients nor patients who are participating in the Medicaid expansion products, um, it's a problem. And, and I think we have to think this, if it's happening at this level, if we expand what we're doing going forward, whatever the design of the healthcare system may be for, for payment, that lack of participation um, in healthcare is a real issue. Um, Do we have any questions from the audience yet? Oh, let me pose perhaps one other question then. Uh, anyone else have a comment on that particular? Yes. Yeah, it, it just, um, I just want to say <coughs> one thing about the Affordable Care Act. I think it's really remarkable that we're in a state of political debate in the United States where the majority of the House Democrats are actually endorsing, sponsoring legislation that would basically repeal the ACA. I mean, they're going to a single payer system. And the, the Republicans, of course, have been opposed to the ACA since 2010. We've actually con we're really in a very, very different place politically right now. I mean, this is really quite remarkable, if you think about it. The thing that I think is significant here is that the ACA was very, very well intentioned. I think Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, did, frankly, the best he could, but I think he made some tremendous, um, made some tremendous miscalculations. I'm not saying that's all his fault, but for example, just think back on the whole issue of cost, which really drives this debate. You know, if you ask Americans what is the issue with healthcare, it's the cost. Uh, he told us that with the adoption of uh, his signature legislative achievement, that there would be a significant reduction in health insurance costs for the typical family. The, the, the number he actually used was $2,500. My, that's my recollection. What we've seen, of course, is something exactly the opposite. In the very first year that the ACA went into effect in the individual and small group market, you saw an explosion of health care costs. And that explosion basically continued up until just about now. Uh, between 2013 and 2017, premiums in the individual market went up 105%. The thing that I think is dramatic about our situation right now is that we are starting to see something that we did not think we would see. And that is a start, an erosion of insurance coverage among people who are basically middle class. Those people who are not getting subsidies in the ACA, who are faced with skyrocketing premiums. In the state of Maryland, I was chairman of the Maryland Health Care Commission. I followed it very closely. You had situations where people were paying $1,600 a month for insurance, which was the equivalent of a second mortgage. And then they would have uh, deductibles, family deductibles, $8,000. Uh, 
Dr. Wolhandler is right about some of these high deductibles. But the high deductibles, the biggest victory for high deductibles came, oddly enough, with the ACA. The other thing that I think is remarkable is that private health insurance coverage, in terms of the enrollment in private health insurance coverage, has actually shrunk over the past few years. You've had a robust expansion of Medicaid, right? About almost 80 to 90 percent of the newly covered people are covered under Medicaid. But if the ACA was designed to improve the private health insurance markets, then it has not been successful at all. What is really remarkable is where we are, however, now, and that is the fact that majorities of both parties, and certainly the House of Representatives, are actually in favor of replacing yeah. the ACA. Bob, you're gonna, maybe we need to move on, okay? Okay. Yeah, there's All a right. lot of other panels, a lot That's of other it. questions. Yeah. Questions? questions? I agree. Yes. Hi, I'm Jawad. I'm a resident at BMC, and I'm a member of the MMS. Uh, I was a little bit confused about the MMS stance on, on health care. It, it seemed to me like pluralism and single payer is kind of contradictory in the sense that if you have more than one payer, it's no longer single payer. So I was wondering if you could uh, explain that. Right. It's a great question. Thanks. And um, the policy that you saw there was pre the new policy that we had on health, including health care as a basic human right. So that was older policy, and we are actually now in the process of looking at our, all of those many policies that you saw listed there to coming, being able to come forward with something that is um, more relevant to our current policy at the Medical Society and more relevant to the discussions going on right now in health care. So um, you're right. As written, it would seem like it was the, the key for us is we want to be sure that whatever the discussion was, that we we are open to doing what's best for patients and for healthcare's future. And if that is a pluralistic system with a whatever that might be, fine. If that's a single payer system, great. We just want to be sure we're at that table for our patients and for healthcare. Great. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a point. Uh, uh, actually, make a point about your comments about. Um, the problems that were middle class with premiums could the doctors, well what is your what's your proposal what's your plan what's your vision for the future well, if we're going to have this tension and this strife I mean I, I have my, I agree. my concern. and number two yeah. is I'd like a more thorough evaluation on the panel because the Urban Institute study is getting a lot of coverage a lot of play in the media and we need to come we need to thoroughly look at this to see if is the data precise? Is, is the design and the methodology clear? And because it is having an impact right now. Thank you. Yeah, shall I take the Urban, Urban Institute study? I have actually written an analysis of it. Um, uh, if you email me, I can send it to you. It's up on the Physicians for National Health Program website. The simple version of why they came up with such a high cost is they lowballed the administrative savings they said the administrative savings are tiny, uh, and then they greatly exaggerated the surge in utilization that you're going to get. So the numbers I gave you about overhead being 2% or being in Canadian hospitals, being half what they are in U.S. hospitals, that's what happened in the real world. Those are not assumptions. That's the basis of me saying that. Similarly, my statement that utilization is, does not surge, it may go up a little bit, but not much, is based on what has happened in the wor real world with the Affordable Care Act, with Medicare and Medicaid before that, with Canada, with Sweden, with Finland, with Australia, okay? So in the real world, we don't see surges and we do see administrative savings, but Urban Institute did another set of assumptions based on their review of the literature, micro-level studies, you know, micro-level studies may have very different results from what happens when you have a society-wide change in coverage. So that's Dr. the brief version. Dr. Liu? Um, back in, I think, March of this year, the New York Times ran a piece comparing five different studies. So it was Urban's prior uh, Medicare for All study from 2016, the RAND study, the Mercatus study, uh, Ken Thorpe's study, and I believe one more. And what they did was they compared on key assumptions like the administrative savings, what were the differences across these five studies. So it's a nice way to kind of look and see what's the range that's possible. Another key one is the provider payment rates. 
Um, and there's a couple of different um, sets of assumptions that they present all together. So it's a nice comparison if you want to look, look that up. I saw another hand over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Mary Warner. Um, I'm interested in hearing from the panelists. I'll use, um, I'll choose my words wisely. I'd like to know if Medicare for All, um, as we've seen it, um, the Senator Sanders bill, um, is uh, brought forth and, and enacted, what would be um, the first steps to roll out such a plan, if anyone has any ideas about that? All right, I, I just wanna make one brief comment, which was Medicare, which covered 19 million U.S. seniors, a very high cost group. Medicare was passed in July 1965. It was implemented, fully implemented, 11 months later. So if there's a decision to implement something, you can do it. Other panelists? Com uh, answer, to, answer to the question? I don't know what the first step would be, but I believe Sanders' plan does lay out some transition steps. So there are some transition steps to take the current Medicare beneficiaries, um, expand their coverage. So currently Medicare doesn't cover everything, right? There's still a good amount of out-of-pocket payments. So it would be first ramping up the current Medicare uh, coverage and then expanding. And I think it's about a, it's a four-year transition, if I remember correctly. J. Powell's bill is maybe a two-year. So there's a couple of different versions um, that have different transition periods. Um, what the first step would be, I think it depends on the bill. I, yes. I think that the long transition is problematic. I think that if you make a decision that you're going to cover everyone, that we certainly um, have the capability. I mean, uh, our, our ca capability now compared to 1965 are much greater in terms of our ability to turn it on. And in terms of uh, if you covered everyone and then made a decision that people would have to opt out, um, we could do it quickly. And I think that uh, the transition of four years is, is quite problematic. We have a question back here. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Sandra Hernandez. I'm the president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. I also serve on the board of the uh, exchange in California, Covered California, and I want to make just two um, clarifications to something that was said by uh, the panelists with regard to the ACA. Uh, first, the ACA was passed, was never implemented that way. Uh, the mandate was eliminated. States were given the option to go into Medicaid or not. In California, we've got a million and a half people enrolled very large risk pool. Our average rates of increase in premiums have been between three and 7%, not 105%. It's the largest state, it's the largest risk pool, it's a core tenant of ACA. Uh, and now there are states that are going about, in fact, uh, approving the mandate. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to say is that um, the point was well made with regard to having insurance doesn't necessarily assure access, and we certainly have problems in rural California with our Medicaid, Medi Medi-Cal expansion there. But I think it's also important to say that you can't actually get access until you get people into some kind of coverage. And again, the ACA, as it was legislated and passed, was not how it was implemented. It was uh, a thousand cuts in a million different ways. And so we have many different versions of the ACA in the country right now. I just wanted to clarify those two things with regard to California. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, we have a question. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much. My name is uh, Nason Mani, and I'm a Harkness Fellow uh, based here, but from the UK. Um, I guess uh, being from the UK, I feel sort of very privileged that I have, have not had to pay for healthcare for most of my adult life. And um, I'm really curious about some of the fears associated with universal healthcare, particularly around the generation of a two-tier system, because it seems to me like the current system has some pretty awful tiers, you know, uninsured, underinsured, and, you know, not great life expectancy across most age groups and not great uh, sort of preventable death statistics. Um, so I wonder where does, A, where does that fear come from? And B, why is there so much fear about taking some money out of the system? So the cost of drugs, for example, in the US is extortionate really compared to what it is in much of Europe. And part of that has to do with once you have a single payer system, you can negotiate price a lot more effectively. And also, you can influence demand because when you're on the hook for all medical bills, you start to think about how can you restructure parts of your society to be healthier? Because otherwise, you're going to have to pay anyway, right? 
So you, if you don't prevent AIDS by giving PrEP, mm -hmm. you're going to be on the hook for paying someone's you know, AIDS medication for the rest of their lives. So I was just wondering about some of these fears and where they come from. Anybody want to respond? I, you know, I think you've made so many great points. Uh, we probably shouldn't actually talk about um, the American political situation and why people are so fearful, uh, given we've only got a few minutes left. But they're, gr they're absolutely great questions and great points you made. Thanks. So uh, let me, uh, uh, in order to answer some of those questions, you have to understand how we got here from there, uh, basically. And it's not that we developed our system in a logical fashion. It was a series of events that happened over time. So for example, employer-based insurance is really a phenomenon that came out of the Second World War uh, when wages were capped and uh, the only benefit you could give was health care at a time when it was not very costly. So there are many factors and uh, the panelists can expand on that. But to that point, maybe the panelists can also talk about We've talked about what the, what effect it would have on the individuals, what government would have to do. Uh, uh, what do you think the effect would be on employers? How could employers make the transition? Well, I think that when we talk about single payer, we're talking about spending, we already spend enough on health care, um, and we're talking about pooling those dollars. So employers would have to still pay into mm -hmm. a system just as um, those who have the financial wherewithal. Um, to, to pay into the system, whether it's you know through your your income tax, but it's it's everyone a, a collective uh, payment system. So um, I think that the, the there are clearly employers who do not pay employers who have uh, small uh, companies who have maybe only a few employees who currently may not provide coverage, mm -hmm. and there would be an expectation that they would have to contribute as as well as everyone else. Um, I think the important thing here is is that. Um, it's, it's everyone, a level in that everyone is paying uh, some rate, um, those who have the uh, financial wherewithal to, to pay. I, I think that it's important also that, you know, we were, there was a reference to the fact that it's a, we would have a limited resource in terms of the amount of health care we could deliver and we would have to ration it. And I, I would say that in this country we do ration health care, but we ration health care based on people's ability to pay it to their need to receive it. And so um, if everyone's in, invested in the same way, we have a uh, tremendous opportunity to, to see where uh, we can go. Yes. It, just to speak a little bit to the question of fears among the public um, and also to the employer question, you know, employer-sponsored health insurance is familiar to people. That is where most people in our country get their insurance. They may not have a great love for their insurance company, but they're used to it. And this idea, you know, people are afraid of their taxes going up, even though you try and tell them, well, your health care costs are going to come down. You know, we did a survey question. We said, do you think if your employer no longer had to pay for your health insurance that your wages would go up? No, they don't believe that. So they probably also don't believe that my taxes will go up, but my health care costs will go down. The, the public fears change. Um, even if they don't love the current situation, the unknown is even scarier. I also, frankly, I think there's been a lot of misinformation about, uh, uh, you know, your taxes would go up under single payer, uh, your total costs would go up, the middle class would suffer financially under single payer, including from some of the Democratic candidates who are parroting Republican talking points. So uh, there is a lot of misinformation about the realities of uh, national health program. Yeah, I, they're, they're, the biggest misinformation is that employers actually pay for health care. Every dollar increase in your health care benefits package is a decrease in your, in your wages or your other compensation. With regard to the impact of this, of course, the impact on employers would be dramatic. It would be enormous. Uh, and, and frankly, I think in many cases, as far as the, you know, the political impact of it would be, it would actually be mixed. Um, some employers would be very, very concerned about it. There is, there, there, even today, there is a very, very strong paternalistic sense about taking care of people who work for you in order to attract and retain, uh, 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 retain staff. But getting back to the question, uh, this is where Stephanie and I really will never agree. Uh, well, of course, we probably don't agree on much, including the, <laughs> rain, <laughs> the rainfall. But the point is, the direction of the rainfall, the point is, is that um, having said that, the kind of taxes that would be required to replace all of the current 
you know, payments that exist in the private sector would be enormous. Now, we only have one, we only have one analysis, as far as I know, of the tax impact of a single-payer system, but it's outdated. It's the Thorpe analysis going back to 2016. Um, what Thorpe did is he looked at what Senator Sanders was proposing. Sanders proposed a 4% income tax, basically, increase, household income tax, plus a 7.5% payroll tax, an employer-based payroll tax. Thorpe's point was, and it was the point made by Urban, and, you know, uh, and people here disagree with it. That's why I say CBO should enter this debate. Having said that, what he said was that the actual payroll tax would be about 14% or over 14%, and the, and the, and the household income tax would be about 5.7. Now you're talking about a 20% tax on income. Now that is enormous, and that will be a focus of the debate, I'm telling you. So we're almost out of time. Is there a burning, another burning question from the audience? Hi, I'm yes. Jackie Ellis, and I'm a PhD candidate in health services research here at BU. Can you speak up just a little? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so we spoke quite a bit about estimating like the monetary costs associated with health reform. I was wondering if you all could talk about a bit about the evidence that we need um, to sort of estimate or understand uh, things like quality of life, health outcomes, so maybe the non-monetary um, effects of the reform. All right, death rates in the United States are significantly higher in other developed nations. In fact, our life expectancy hasn't risen in the past five years. Meanwhile, all other developed countries are seeing increases in life expectancy. Um, we do see that the leading cause of dings on your credit report nationally is medical bills. We also know that about 500,000 people each year in the United States do go bankrupt uh, at least, uh, due to medical illness and medical bills, uh, that two-thirds of those people, actually three-quarters of those people had health insurance at the point when they first got ill. Two-thirds of them had private health insurance. So there's a lot of very high costs of doing nothing, both in terms of family economic security and human life. Yes, Dr. Bumba. Sure. Uh, thank you. And to follow, great question. To follow on to that, um, you look at a state like Massachusetts, we have universal coverage but 10% of our population is food insecure. So you talk about quality of life. Are we even looking at the right things? Are we even addressing the right things in our, our plan for coverage going forward? So it's an opportunity we have right now. I mean, as we're looking at all of these different systems of, of payment or, pay, or design of healthcare, um, to be able to address what really matters for health and which is not what those of us as physicians on the stage are doing. I mean, it's a part of it, but it's not the majority part of that. But how do we, how do we really do this better? So again, we have an opportunity, I think, going forward to Dr. be able to address Lou, that. Dr. Uh, Lou, Ms. Hamill, any questions, any comments? Dr. Lou? I mean, I do think that um, the healthcare system does so much, right? The social determinants of health, there's so many other things that affect health outcomes. It's hard to say to that a single payer will get you to the health outcomes. A lot of health care that's provided now, there are there is appropriate care, there's still inappropriate care happening. So I think that linkage is hard. I think there's a lot of other uh, factors that uh, would be um, just as influential, if not more influential. Well, this continues to be a complex and complicated uh, topic, uh, which uh, we'll continue to sort out. But I hope that today's uh, panel presentations has provided you with additional uh, information that you can factor into how you look at the development uh, of a single payer system. So let's give our panelists a round of applause uh, for their great presentations. And we invite you to have something in the back. Thank you so much.